Uh, good morning. We're just uh, waiting for a few more people to uh, uh, sign in here, and we'll get started here shortly. Looks like we've got a few more signed in, so uh, we can get started just in a little bit. So just uh, bear with us for a minute or two and uh, you know, maybe enjoy some coffee or you know some breakfast while you're eating here or watching or attending. So hopefully everybody's enjoying the looks like it's gonna be a nice day out there today and uh, maybe you can uh, go out and maintain to some bees and uh, learn about some genetics later and then go out and uh, work on mites and those type of things. Okay, I guess, uh, let's see, so we've got a couple more here. So just bear with us just for a couple seconds. We'll uh, get started here shortly. We'll, uh, yeah. All right, so we can uh, see, we'll go ahead then. Uh, good morning. We would like to thank everyone for joining us today for SIS May 2023rd Agribusiness Forum and to our sponsors. I would like to introduce myself. My name is Adam Hentz. And I'm the Marketing Communication Specialist at SIFT. For those not familiar with SIFT, SIFT is an MEP partner with the Ohio Manufacturing Extension Partnership, who is part of a nationwide public-private partnership with centers in all 50 states and Puerto Rico, dedicated to serving small and medium-sized manufacturers. SIFT is one of the six center affiliates in the state of Ohio. Our vision is to be part of the solutions and innovation for food manufacturing and agribusiness. We work to achieve this vision through a unique blend of direct services, a membership consortium made up of leading companies in the food space and vast network resources and other partnerships. Our goal is to increase competitiveness and growth in Northwest Ohio and throughout the state. The Ag Forum is a platform to use agribusiness industries, food industries and support organizations to promote new products and services and information to Northwest Ohio regional agriculture and food industry professionals commercial farmers and hobbyists, along with individuals interested in venturing into these markets. We would like to give a special thank you to Michelle Wallace for speaking with us today. Michelle is the Central State Agriculture and Natural Resource Extension Educator for Northwest Ohio. She has been in Central State for over two years. Prior to this, she worked for North Carolina State University Extension Service as a Durham County horticulture agent for over 10 years. She has over 25 years related work experience. As a Central State University Extension educator, she provides outreach education and support to beginning farmer and those with less than 10 years experience, alternative agriculture and underserved populations. Michelle grew up in Kibbutz in Israel where she worked alongside her dad in the Kiwi vineyards and apple orchards. Michelle participated in Northwest Ohio beekeeping internship training during the pandemic. While more of, being, more of a beginning beekeeper, she will share information about the research being done in Central State to improve bee genetics. Today, Michelle will be speaking with us on Does My Hive Have Good Genes? If you have any questions during the session, please feel free to uh, go to the question and answer function and we will share your questions after Michelle has completed her presentation. At this time, everyone, please welcome Michelle Wallace. And uh, we'll look forward to hearing her presentation. Go ahead, Michelle. Okay. What? Uh, you want to share your... Can everyone see my screen? Yes. All right. So does your hive have good genes? The whole the purpose of this presentation is to give you guys a better understanding of the research being done at Central State University to help improve 
hive genetics and bees because of all of the troubles bees are having. So to give you an overview, annual bee, of annual bee losses, uh, not just in Ohio, but across the United States, roughly 30 to 40% of beekeepers annually lose their colonies. Uh, in Ohio, it's higher. We, we have about 60 to 70% uh, losses um, because on top of all of the challenges that fa bees face, uh, bees have to get through the winter as well. Uh, the main cause of colony, colony losses is due to a parasitic mite called Varroa destructor. And uh, some of the things that we're finding with uh, the in within the bee genetics is that worker bees with slightly smaller mandibles are a little bit better at grooming. Uh, one of the things that you learn about bees is that uh, they're very clean animals and uh, the cleanliness of the hive is something that's very important. And so that's one of the traits that breeders are looking to improve. And the breeding, the breeding programs going not just in at Central State, but across the United States are looking for traits that will help bees uh, become stronger so that instead of uh, depending on beekeepers, to um, try and help mitigate varroa mites, the bees themselves will help. So some bees are better groomers and uh, sanitation is really, really important with the hive. The bees are always uh, trying to keep invaders out. They create a substance called propolis and to that they use to in in the hives to keep invaders out. But the other thing they do is the workers um, clean each other before um, coming back from gathering pollen and nectar and entering the hive. And some some bees and some hives have better genetics, and they do a better job at at cleaning each other. And this hygienic behavior isn't something that is learned, it's actually inherited. Um, but only 10% of honeybee colonies are fully hygienic and have this trait. trait. So some of the features that researchers are looking to introduce at is, is are these traits that help with mite resistance. So they're looking for bees that have higher grooming behaviors. They have this feature called mite biting. So that, that is the bees are using their own mandibles in the grooming process to find the varroa mites that are coming into the hive on the back of bees and, and biting parts of their bot of the mite off. And in doing so, the mite will drop and fall. And then the other characteristic that they're looking for are, are bees that remove the sick brood and the mites from the hive. So this is this picture is just showing you a microscopic uh, photograph from a from a microscope of a mandible, a bee mandible, and what they're looking at is the size of the mandible, because uh, bees that have smaller mandible, uh, the the portion of the man this portion here of the mandible is, is smaller, they have a little bit better ability to bite parts of the mite off. And
like um And what you can see here in all eight letters, I hope internet isn't great. Uh, in picture B, you can see the arrows are pointing to um, legs of the varroa mite that were bitten off by uh, the bee workers. And in D, you can see in this slide that a portion of the body of the varroa mite was, was bitten and removed. And then C is just showing you a young, uh, mature mite. So researchers are collecting uh, these, in, these varroa mites uh, from hives on, that fall on the bottom board, not well, a lot of uh, beekeepers treat their, their hives with pesticides and in doing so, the mites will fall to the bottom board. They're actually wanting to collect uh, the bottom boards before the hive is treated so that they can look on the bottom boards to see if the varroa mites are missing legs and, and count to see what percentage of varroa mites are missing legs. So if you can see here on these, these are some, some photos that are showing you um, some examples of, of legs that are missing from mite biter bees. And what they're doing at the university is when they find a beehive that has a large percentage of mite biter bees, ones that are able to remove, uh, have good grooming uh, skills and are, are removing and biting the legs or portions of the varroa mites, um, they're gathering drones, drones from that hive and artificially inseminating queens. I know it sounds a little bit crazy, but this picture is showing you. Now, naturally, a, bee, a queen bee, when she flies out for a mating flight, um, she will mate between uh, 15 to 20 uh, drones. In, in a mating flight. But in, in this instance, when you're trying to improve genetics of bees, uh, they have to collect a lot of drones um, in order to artificially inseminate um, a queen. And, and, and this is the process in which they're doing it. It's, it's hard to imagine because, you know, we artificially inseminate cows um, but bees are a lot smaller and they have a stinger, but um, this is what they're doing to see what kind of impact it has and whether or not they're able to introduce new genetics into a hive. So what they're finding is that na the native feral honeybees have these shorter long edge mandibles than domestic bees. The shorter long edge mandibles make grooming in the hive a lot easier, a lot more effective. And the, and the mandible itself is able to um, more easily remove portions of uh, the mites. So what, what Central State University is doing is we are breeding Ohio mite biters number one. They're, they're, they have different classifications and this is, this is what they're calling um, the, the, bee, the bees that are being bred from Central State's research lab. The, the goal is to reduce the need for managing bees with chemicals and by, by improving the genetics. So 
We reduce the potential for growing chemical miticide resistance. So the more you use um, chemicals in a hive, the, the mites are will adapt themselves. A lot of times uh, they, they multiply a lot faster than we're able to, um, to create, and they can, because of, because of their ability to multiply very fast, they can have become resistant to some of the pesticides that are being used to manage, uh, manage them. So the, the goal is to improve the bee genetics so that they can fend for themselves and reduce the populations of mites uh, that, that are impacting them. And it, and it helps to play a critical role in the long-term sustainability of the hive. So ways that beekeepers across the state of Ohio can help is if, if they are willing to send in the bottom board uh, of their hive, uh, a lot of hives have a white um, bottom board that, that is disposable and they can take, when they can take that out of their hive before they've treated with pesticides, wrap it up in a like saran wrap and mail it in to central state. And the researchers will look to see and they will count the number of varroa mites on the bottom board, and they will also look to see how many of those mites have have um, been bitten and have are missing legs or portions of their body. Um, samples can also be collected in uh, these little plastic containers, like what you get at um, a restaurant with your salad dressing. And this is the address of Dr. Hong Mei, who is doing the research. So uh, this is just an opportunity for beekeepers across the state to get involved in helping with the research so that they can also um, help solve the problem. Uh, and if uh, our researchers at Central State identify um, that your hive as a beekeeper is a, has good genetics, they may contact the beekeeper and ask if they can collect a sample of their drones so that they can use those drones uh, for artificially inseminating a queen. So um, varroa mites, just to recap, they have eight legs. So this slide is, is showing you an enlarged picture of a varroa mite with some of its legs missing. Uh, some of the legs are bent. And uh, just, just to give you an idea, if you, can, if you couldn't see where those missing legs were, there they are. Here's another photo, and if, and if you look, uh, can you find the bitten legs is what it's asking you. And if you look, you can see that some are bent, but the next slide will show you that these two have been bitten. If you have a microscope at home or access to a microscope, uh, this is something that beekeepers can do if they don't want to send uh, their bottom board to find out if their hive has good genetics and they have access to a microscope, uh, they can see for themselves if, if they have some good genes. And these are some additional resources that you, we have available. Uh, some of the articles that have been written and, and published. And this is my contact information. Uh, anyone who has questions about this topic or would like, uh, I do have a microscope at my, in my access. 
if if anyone would like to um, to see if they have good good genetics as well. And and that's it. I'm going to stop sharing. If anyone has any questions, uh, I'll do my best. All right, we have our first question from Karen Wood. She says, are you using Italian, Russian, or what type of bees in the studies or both? So what they're trying to do is they're using feral bees. So they're, they have been collecting, they, they're looking for feral bees in the state of Ohio. They are using also bees from, with, they have a joint study that they're doing with Purdue. So some of the bees that they're, they're using are um, from Indiana. Indiana has got some special bee um, genetics as well. I have another question from Lori Dreyer. Is this a weakness brought in because of our control of bee hives? Is, is the weakness caused because of the beekeeper um, in, input? Is that what I'm, I'm trying to understand the question? Is this weakness brought in because of our control of beehives? So bees have been domesticated for thousands of years, thousands of years. And the likelihood of pests uh, becoming involved, it, it, there's so many pests that bees are faced with. Um, I think that it's not so much because of what beekeepers are doing with domesticated bees as, you know, there's pests, there's a lot of things that face bees. There's lots of diseases out there. There's there's pesticides that bees encounter and the varroa mites are just one more pest out there that impact bees. Um, if it, it's not necessarily because of what beekeepers are doing, it's just because there's so many pests out there that, that they have to face that, that the likelihood of having a pest or a disease it, it just increases and it's not, I don't think, I think that if anything, as long as beekeepers are checking their hives and doing everything they can to help bees, it's definitely not something that that beekeepers, one thing that is heart hurting bees is, you know, a lot of bees are transported across the country. Um, to help pollinate certain crops like almonds. And, and that just stresses bees out. So things that cause stress are definitely gonna impact the health of the hive, but not necessarily um, the cause. Any other sure questions? Yeah, hi, Michelle. I have another question from Kay. I apologize if I mispronounced your last name. Moiser, how can the researchers be certain that the drones from your targeted hives are the ones who are inseminating that hives queen? So, so um, drones, I, I'm, so you're wanting to know how they know that the drones from a specific hive are inseminating a queen as far as in the research. What they're doing is they find a hive that has good bee genetics, a lot of mite biters, and they're taking the drones from that hive, not all of them, just a sampling. It, it, while, while in natural world, it takes 15 to 20 drones to, uh, in, um, to inseminate a, a queen when they're artificially inseminating a queen, they, they need 50 or 60 drones because you know things happen in the process. They're, they're getting uh, the drone semen out and they are 
artificially inseminating it using a syringe into the queen as opposed to, you know, how it would happen in nature. Um, so that's how they know is they know which, where the drones are coming from that hive is they're getting the drones out of a hive that's been identified as a hive that has good mite biters because they can see on the bottom boards that, that, that there are a lot of dead varroa mites that are missing body parts. So they know that that hive has good genetics. They're collecting a bunch of drones from that hive and taking it to a queen. And they're trying to get queens that they have bred through their queen breeding program. And uh, feral bees are larger and they know where those bees are coming from. And so they're putting, and that's just a process of that's how they know is through artificial insemination. I hope that answers your question. It's that very like hard Katie. to imagine. Looks like Katie has a follow-up question. Wouldn't would greater genetic diversity improve honeybee survival? It would, and um, it would, and that's why they're co collecting the genetics from. Um, Feral bees, feral bees are will as opposed to domestic bees. Karen Wood also has a follow up question. It says, do Ohio's native bees have the same issues with mites, or do Roma mites target European honeybees gene types? So Ohio feral bees do have problems with mites, but they are. They have been found to be better equipped to managing um, their ferals. So they haven't been domesticated and they have a, a higher percentage of hygienic uh, traits. So they aren't being managed and, and, and they have had to find gen over time in order to survive, and they have had to manage the hive better themselves. So they have higher incidences of um, hygienic uh, traits. Okay. I have a, is there a certain type of year where mites are more prominent to start investing, infesting? I, I didn't under, hear the question, what? Is there a certain time of year where mites are more prominent to start infesting? So um, bees, our beekeepers are, are starting to either get their their nukes uh, around now and in June. Um, and once once the bees are in the hives, beekeepers start checking their hives every month to see what the population of varroa mites is. Uh, it's something that they have to do um, uh, Throughout the um, the the summer and the fall, they have to, and and it's a, something that they should be doing monthly. Is there any type of vegetation that can kind of prevent mites from going around the hives, or quite the opposite, draw them? There's they're really small, and um, I I don't I know. What I would say is not so much to prevent you. I don't know that you can prevent the mites from being mites are are one of those they they're gonna be in and they're in the environment. We kind of have to manage them. We know that they're there, but for if you're keeping bees and for the bees, um, having a great diversity of of flowering plants that have lots of nectar and lots of pollen that helps the bees help themselves. So the healthier that you can, the healthier the environment is for the bees, the, the better they are to fend themselves as well. So having a lot of um, pollen and nectar producing plants. And you can find, uh, there's a great publication uh, that is produced by SARE. Uh, SARE stands for uh, 
sustainable agriculture resource education on um, on pollinating be beneficial pollinating plants. And uh, the more of those you can have around, that's that's really great for the bees. It won't necessarily keep the varroa mites away, but the healthier the bees, uh, they, the more able they are to uh, manage the hive themselves. All right, if, you, if anybody has any more questions, uh, we have Michelle here who's an expert who can address any questions you have. So now is the time to uh, add to them. So I'll give you a moment or two. So just feel free to type in your questions and answers, our questions, and um, we'll, we'll share them with you. And I can always be reached by email at mwallace at centralstate.edu. If there's, if you want me to send you a, a link to that publication that I mentioned on um, beneficial pollinating plants for bees, I'd be happy to. Yeah, it looks like that's uh, gonna be all the questions today. And uh, I'd like to thank you, Michelle, for speaking today. And uh, thank you all for your time today and participating in this May 8th forum. And uh, again, thank you to Michelle Wallace and the Central State University of Agriculture and Natural Resource Extension Educator Program. Really appreciate you coming out working with us today and talking about the bee, bee genetics and everything. Uh, also, to just let you know, the next Agribusiness Forum will be held on June 15th, featuring Bridget Burgess from Herzl Canning and Farms, presenting on their facilities consisting of compost, grain cleaning, organic farm and rotation and the use of cover crops. We will look forward to seeing you then, and uh, you all have a terrific day. Goodbye. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.